Hello, BISC 132. This is the beginning of recorded lecture 4.3, starting on the nervous system. So uh, I'm going to be honest, this is probably one of the most complicated chapters we're going to have in the entire quarter. Uh, the I'm going to break this down as, as best I can, but the mechanisms involved in the nervous system and how nerves you know send information uh, is it, just really complicated. So there are actually two things involved in this process. One is the, the neuron sending information from one end to the other, just information moving within that single cell. The other uh, part is when the information is delivered from one neuron to another neuron, from one cell to another cell. So let's start with the more complicated of the two. Uh, let's start with the movement of information from one end of the neuron to the other end of the neuron. And to understand this, we need to look at a little bit of background about what's going on in a neuron. So neurons use something called a sodium-potassium pump. This is a membrane-bound transport system. And just a quick chemistry review if it's been a while since you've had a chemistry class uh, sodium is one of those weird elements it's na it's got a positive charge potassium is k it's got a positive charge just we'll see figures and stuff that use na and k so anyway what's going on with this pump well the sodium potassium pump is a membrane bound transport system so here's the pump embedded in the cell membrane of a neuron and it is going to pump three sodium atoms out and two potassium in. Those are very important numbers and we'll understand why in, you know, soon enough. Uh, and it is spending ATP, it is spending energy to do this. So we're sending three sodium out, two potassium in over and over and over again. So the sodium potassium pumps in the membrane use energy from ATP to pump sodium, X3, out of the cell and potassium, X3, or I'm sorry, X2, into the cell. This is important, the, the numbers here, the two and the three, because even though these are both positive charges, a total of plus three charge is being pumped out when three sodium is going out but only plus two is coming in because there are two you know, single positively charged potassiums coming in. So what this does uh, is this eventually leads to a difference in charge outside of the cell relative to inside of the cell. And here's where just the, the terminology can be a little confusing. It is more positively charged outside of the cell and more negatively charged inside of the cell. And this is the statement that I think confuses a lot of students because we're not dealing with any negative charges at all. We're only dealing with positive charges, but it's all relative to one another because more positive is being pumped out than in. It ends up being more positive on the inside. And again, relatively speaking, more negative inside of the cell. This creates what's called the resting membrane potential. We need a visualization here. This is what this looks like. And, and this is measurable with a tiny, tiny little voltmeter. You can measure the difference, negative inside of the cell, positive outside of the cell. Uh, I'm trying to avoid too many numbers, but this is an important one. Negative 70 millivolts. When a neuron is at rest, Again, we haven't relayed any information yet. This is all just backstory. The resting membrane potential of a neuron is negative 70 millivolts inside relative to outside. And again, it's easy to remember which one's positive and which one's negative. You're, you're going to get a lot of mileage out of memorizing this statement. Three sodium out, two potassium in. Three sodium out, two potassium in. Three sodium out, two potassium in. Drill it into your brain. And if you know that, you will be able to conclude, of course, it's positive on the outside because, you know, more of it is pumped, pumped out uh, than is coming in. So, of course, it's negative on the inside. So, 
resting membrane potential, negative 70 millivolts inside relative to outside. So again, that was all backstory. If we want to talk about the actual movement of information, we have to talk about what's called the action potential. So uh, this is communication along a neuron. It is propagated by what's called the action potential. So, okay, uh, the action potential begins with a stimulus. Uh, and I'm being very vague about what is starting this whole thing because there are a lot of different things that, that, can, that can begin an action potential. J just to keep things simple and, and to picture this in your head, one of the most common stimuli that can start an action potential is some sort of chemical signal. So a chemical signal, for example, can come to a neuron, stimulate it, and start the action potential. What this stimulus does is it opens up a sodium channel in a localized area. So at resting potential, here's our sodium channel. If you remember from BISC-130, a channel is something that lets ions flow in or lets you know, add uh, ions or molecules or whatever. It lets stuff freely flow inside or outside of the cell wherever diffusion wants them to go. So a stimulus causes the opening of a sodium channel in a localized area. Hey, I put it in the key terms as well. A membrane protein that allows a substance to pass through its hollow core across the plasma membrane. Now, if you have diligently memorized this phrase, three sodium out, two potassium in, three sodium out, two potassium in, you should be able to conclude what is about to happen when we open up a sodium channel. We've been pumping a whole bunch of it out of the cell. So as soon as this channel opens, of course, a bunch of it is going to come into the cell. Now, if you think about this in, in big picture terms, that is a bunch of positive charge coming into the cell. Remember what the resting membrane potential is. It's supposed to be negatively charged, relatively, inside of the cell. If you have a bunch of positive charge coming in, that is going to completely mess up that resting membrane potential. In fact, it's going to cause it to flip. Uh, in the area where this stimulus has caused the opening of sodium channels, and again, it's just a localized area, not the entire neuron, this is going to lead to more positive charge on the inside and more negative on the outside. Again, this is, this is the opposite of what it's supposed to be at rest. This, this flip-flop of membrane potential is called depolarization. And this region of the neuron where these sodium channels have opened, allowing sodium to come into the cell, the, this region has become depolarized. So stimulus causes opening of sodium channels in a localized area. Sodium enters the cell, leads to depolarization. And this is defined in the key terms in, in, in kind of a weird way. Uh, the key terms call this change in the membrane potential to a less negative value. Less, less negative just means more positive. So it, it becomes positive on the inside and negative on the outside. Think of it as a flip-flop, a reversal. Uh, the membrane is now about 40 millivolts inside relative to outside. It's always inside relative to outside. So it went from negative 70 to positive 40. But uh, this is not going to uh, last forever. Uh, eventually, this channel is going to close, but not before this depolarization affects the region nearby. So one way to make a sodium channel open up is by a chemical stimulus, some chemical binding to it. Another way to trigger a sodium channel to open up like this is a nearby change in voltage. So <laughs> here's, here's where it gets interesting. This depolarization, again, just in this region of the neuron, is a change in voltage. It went from negative 70 to positive 40. This depolarization is going to trigger 
a depolarization in the nearby region, the region of the neuron right next to it, because this region has sodium channels that are gonna open up in response to this depolarization. So the, the initial depolarization uh, in, in, I'm sorry, the depolarization in one region of the neuron leads to what are called voltage-gated, meaning they, they respond to changes in voltage, voltage-gated sodium channels in a nearby region to open. That's going to cause depolarization in that nearby region. And guess what's going to happen next? This depolarization is going to cause depolarization in this region. And guess what's gonna happen next? Well, okay, my figure only lists three of these, but it's gonna keep happening. The depolarization of one region depolarizes the neighboring region, depolarizes the neighboring region, depolarizes the neighboring region, and so on and so on and so on. This depolarization signal is gonna travel all the way along uh, the, the neuron from one end, from the, from the dendrites down through the axon. So, uh, this depolarization causes another nearby depolarization, etc. The depolarization signal travels along the neuron. Now, meanwhile, this initial region where we had depolarization, like I said a second ago, is not going to stay depolarized forever. Uh, once the depolarization peaks, uh, the sodium channel is going to close and that region of the cell needs to try to to bring things back to normal so after the peak of the depolarization uh, sodium channels are going to close and potassium channels are going to open up so okay again try to guess what's going to happen next the sodium potassium pump has been pumping three sodium out, two potassium in, three sodium out, two potassium in. We've been pumping a bunch of potassium into the cell. Guess what happens when a potassium channel opens up? It's going to try to get out of the cell. So here is uh, an overview showing both of these channels here. Uh, this is you know, resting membrane potential, about negative 70 millivolts, depolarization. The sodium channel uh, opens up, sodium comes into the cell, uh, and you know once it's done its thing, it closes, and now the potassium channel opens up, uh, and potassium is going to go out of the cell. That is going to uh, lead to another big change in the membrane potential here. Uh, when it's repolarizing, having a bunch of that positively charged potassium exiting the cell is going to cause it to become more negative on the inside and more positive on the outside. This is called repolarization. But, but, but actually, it's not perfect at doing this. So potassium channels open, potassium exits the cell, it returns that region to being positive on the outside, negative on the inside, but it overshoots its mark. Uh, it's not perfect at getting to that exact negative 70 millivolt by just opening up the potassium channels. Uh, this leads to what's called hyperpolarization. It, it's as I said, it's going to overshoot its mark. So I, I think this is the, the best way to show this. What's happening in this graph is uh, what is happening in every single region of the neuron as it depolarizes, repolarizes, and goes back to resting. So each region of the neuron is experiencing this in turn. You have resting, you have excitation, where something you know, stimulates the, the sodium channels to open up. You have the peak of depolarization. Here you have the potassium channels opening up. You have working towards repolarization, but it goes past negative 70, leading to hyperpolarization. And what's going to bring it back to completely normal? Uh, you guessed it. The diligent work of the sodium potassium pump is going to bring it back to the perfect negative 70 uh, resting membrane potential. So you know, again, this up and down and sort of overshooting and then back to perfectly normal, that's happening uh, in, in each region of the neuron as it goes from resting, depolarization, and then back to resting again. Now, the interesting thing about this movement, and, and this is a movement, is something is moving 
across the neuron, but it's it's not a physical thing. There's there's no ion that's being like shuttled along the axon from one end of the neuron to the other. There's no you know physical tangible chemical or molecule or something that is making this journey. The thing that's making this journey is the message. <laughs> this this is why it's getting kind of abstract in this chapter. The message, the depolarization signal, is what's traveling from one end of the neuron to the other. Uh, there's a, a, a corny exercise I, I like to do in an in-person class where I have the, the classroom as a whole do uh, the wave, uh, like in a sporting event stadium. So uh, what I have them do is, you know, at one end of the classroom, they'll, you know, one row will raise their hand up and, and that will cause the row next to them to raise their hand up and that will cause the row next to them uh, to raise their hand up. And, you know, as they're doing that, the first rows that had their hands up will we'll put them back down again. And, okay, this is giving me a headache to watch too many times. But you, you can kind of see what's happening here. There is a, a message that's moving across this stadium. No one person is standing up and running from one side to the other. But this, this signal uh, is making its way from one end of the stadium to the other end of the stadium. And that is a great analogy for what's happening here. And the act of standing up and raising your arms in the air and then sitting back down and putting your arms down again, that's exactly what's going on when a, uh, when a single region of the neuron depolarizes, you know, hyperpolarizes a little bit before going back to perfectly resting, the standing up and then sitting back down. Each region does that in turn, just like each row of the stadium uh, or the classroom does that in turn. So uh, again, th this is just an, an analogy, but it, it does a good job of showing how the signal moves from one end of the neuron to the other. Now, uh, one last thing about this, um, it's very important once this, this region of the neuron has depolarized, repolarized, and has gone back to resting, it's important that it's not accidentally triggered by this depolarization. So, you know, this is a region of the neuron that could definitely be stimulated by a nearby change in voltage, but you don't want this signal to go backwards. So after a single region of the neuron has gone through this process, has stood up and, and sat back down, it enters what's called a refractory period where it doesn't care that there's a, a region nearby that's changing its voltage. It's not going to stand up and start its wave again for a, a short period of time. So after opening uh, any of these channels, sodium or potassium, enter a refractory period, they're not going to do anything again for a short while. And again, the importance of this is that this prevents backtracking of the signal. The signal is always only supposed to just travel in one direction. Now remember, all of this action potential stuff was all within a single cell, within a single neuron. All of this was just about moving the information from one end of the cell to the other end of the cell. There is another uh, step uh, that has to happen in this journey, this signal, this information has to pass from this neuron to the next neuron, from one cell to another cell. And to do that, we're going to have a completely different mechanism. So the signal moves from one cell to another via synaptic transmission. Uh, the most common type is called a chemical synapse. So in, instead of being you know, this abstract you know, signal of depolarization wave, once it gets to the, the end of the neuron, we involve actual physical stuff, physical chemicals. The presynaptic neuron releases uh, from a vesicle chemicals called neurotransmitters. There are a lot of different neurotransmitters that exist. They you know, communicate different messages, but I'm just going to be generic and call them neurotransmitters. Uh, they're defined in the key terms as a chemical ligand that carries a signal from one nerve cell to the next. That's simple enough. Uh, so the presynaptic neuron releases these neurotransmitters. 
they have to diffuse across a very short gap called the synapse or the synaptic cleft before they bind to a channel on the postsynaptic neuron and you guessed uh, that postsynaptic neuron is then going to depolarize that region where it bound the channel and it's going to start another depolarization, another depolarization, and the whole thing starts over again. But getting from one cell to the other involves these physical chemical signals at the chemical synapse. So how do I summarize this? All right, so uh, the arrival of an action potential at the axon terminal, so it's the end of the, the axon, causes the release of neurotransmitters from the presynaptic neuron from vesicles. These neurotransmitters diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors on the postsynaptic cell where they start this party over again. They start an action potential in that postsynaptic cell. So yeah, here's an example of this neurotransmitter binding to this channel opening up and yep, starting an action potential in that postsynaptic cell. Now, an important detail here is these neurotransmitters are supposed to be sent out, bind to this channel, start this action potential, and, and then they're supposed to stop. Once they've sent their message, uh, they're done. So it is very important, if we could zoom in on this square here, well, let's zoom in a little bit more. It is very important that once they have sent their message, that these neurotransmitters stop. Uh, you do not want them constantly sending their message over and over and over and over again to the postsynaptic cell. So once they've sent their message, the neurotransmitters are removed. Uh, sometimes, depending on the neurotransmitter, some of them are destroyed by enzymes. Some of them can diffuse away from the synapse. Some of them are actually taken up by the presynaptic neuron. Whatever it takes to get them away from here and not constantly signal to the postsynaptic cell. So uh, neurotransmitters are then cleared from the synapse to prevent continued signaling, like we saw degradation by enzymes or uptake by the presynaptic cell. So uh, I, I said this is usually the way that signals move from one cell, one neuron to, to the next cell. There is another way to do this. So here's our chemical synapse, action potential arriving, synaptic cleft, neurotransmitters. Here we've got the channels, so far so familiar. Here's the other way of doing things. There is such a thing called an electrical synapse. This one's a lot more straightforward. There are structures called gap junctions that simply allow this electrical signal to move from one neuron to the next. So they're, they're just connected, the action potential, the wave or whatever, you know, just seamlessly travels from one neuron to the next. Um, this is obviously a much faster way of doing things. You're not waiting for neurotransmitters to diffuse across this synapse, uh, but it's a lot simpler. So there are a lot of different neurotransmitters that exist and they can send different messages and they cause different responses. This is just signal being sent. So this is not as uh, robust of a signal, but it's definitely faster. Uh, this type of synapse, for example, is used in the heart, where you really want those uh, cardiac muscle cells to be talking to each other very, very quickly to coordinate properly. So all of this was, uh, all of this was about chemical synapses, the neurotransmitters. Here's what I have to say about electrical synapses. These are less common. Gap junctions allow an electrical signal to move from cell to cell. It's faster, but it's simpler. Okay, now that we're done with the, the, the cell level description of how information moves within a neuron and from neuron to neuron, uh, the next topic in this chapter is anatomy. Um, I'm not a fan of this stuff uh, in an intro level class. I, I know this is you know, going to memorize a bunch of stuff. It's going to go in one ear and, and out the other. I, I personally think that it's more important to understand how these things work. Uh, I mean, I mean, certainly in you know further biology classes, you take human A and P. Having this terminology and knowing the names for these things is important to have discussions about them. But for this class, we're not going to do anatomy. Uh, we're not going to do this anatomy either. We're, we're skipping this stuff. 
all I want you to take from these sections that we're skipping is uh, the following two terms. So the central nervous system uh, is a term, or CNS, uh, refers to the brain and the spinal cord. And the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS, uh, is just everything else, all the other nerve tissue in the body. So you should be familiar with these two systems uh, and, you know, which uh, parts are, are parts of which. Uh, but, yeah, as far as brain anatomy stuff, uh, I'm, I'm skipping all this. Don't worry about it at all. Uh, there's another section that I'm skipping uh, about nervous system disorders, uh, and I highly recommend that if you're, you know, you're interested in any of this stuff, um, stuff like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, schizophrenia, depression, epilepsy, go ahead and give this section of the textbook a read, but I'm not covering it. It's kind of beyond the scope of this course. Okay, so segueing from the nervous system to the next chapter. Uh, the next chapter is very closely related. It's sensory systems. This is how we're going to you know, sense the world around us, uh, and these are going to be hooked up to uh, the nervous system so that you can make sense of what you're hearing or smelling or whatever. So there's a, a pretty clear connection between you know, the last chapter uh, and, and this chapter. So let's start off with with some terminology. So our sensory systems use things called sensory receptor cells to convert a stimulus to a feeling. Sensory receptor is defined in the key terms as a specialized neuron uh, or other cells associated with a neuron that is modified to receive specific sensory input. So it's Basically, uh, a neuron that's stimulated by something. So obvious connection here between this chapter and the last one. Uh, converting a stimulus to a feeling. Uh, there are several different types of sensory receptors. Um, a lot of key terms, but don't worry, these all, these all make perfect sense, it, to, to me at least. So uh, mechanoreceptors, uh, it's got mechanism or mechano right in the name. That should think you of, you know, some physical action happening, and that's exactly what it is. Mechanoreceptors are defined in the key terms as a sensory receptor modified to respond to mechanical disturbances, such as being bent, touch, pressure, motion, sound. So our sense of touch is definitely going to use a lot of these. Thermoreceptors, you hear thermo, you should think of temperature. That's exactly what these things are. They're defined in the key terms, receptors that are stimulated by changes in temperature. Uh, chemoreceptors, again, pretty obvious. Chemo, you think chemicals. These are receptors that are stimulated by chemicals or chemical changes. And finally, photoreceptors. You hear photo, you should think of photosynthesis, you should think of photons, you should think of light. These are receptors stimulated by electromagnetic radiation such as light, which is a type of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so again, we're, we're going to, you know, bring these terms up as we go through the chapter. I just wanted to, you know, define these uh, at the top. Now, a couple of other things just to talk about in, in uh, a broad general sense before we talk about the traditional five senses. Um, when, we, when we sense things, you know, when we smell something, you could smell, oh, I, you know, I smell something burning versus, oh, I smell something definitely burning. There's a magnitude to all of our senses. Like, oh, I, I think I hear something in the other room, or I hear something really loud in the other room. The magnitude of any of these sensations is affected by the rate of signaling from these receptor cells, how frequently they're sending signals to the central nervous system, and by the number of receptors sending that signal. You touch something hot with just the tip of your finger, you're going to feel that that's hot, but if you press your whole hand on something really hot, there's going to be a, a larger total number of receptors sending that signal. That's also going to affect the magnitude of a sensation. And Another you know general thing uh, is this is this process uh, from reception to transduction to perception. Basically, this is the the or the sequence of events here. Uh, you sense something. Those receptors are are triggered. They start action potentials because of some sensation uh, that is moved along. The action potential moves along the neuron and then moves from neuron to neuron. All the stuff we did in the last chapter, uh, and this ends with perception, where that signal um, 
reaches neurons in the brain in the central nervous system. You make sense of that uh, and you put it all together and, and then we call that perception. So just big picture stuff. Okay, so we're going to get into the traditional five senses, uh, but this is typically where I've run out of time in the normal in-person lecture. So we will get into those uh, senses and how they work in the next recorded lecture. This is the end of 4.3.